record on the, there we go. Okay, okay. we're going to record on what, Ricardo? Oh, we have the recording and we are live, so. All right. So you're set. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here. Okay, so, okay, so Nandini and Jin Suk and uh, Rose are all here. That's good. So let, let me start. Let me start in English. Uh, también voy a hablar un poco en español. And Francine may say something in French or Portuguese. I don't know. Um, uh, I am uh, Virginia Dominguez, Virginia Dominguez. Uh, I am in, at the University of Illinois, Ben Champaign, uh, past president of the American Anthropological Association, and uh, currently, and sometimes happily, on the organizing committee of the World Council of Anthropological Associations with, with uh, pleasure working with Anthropen. And this is the first in a series of, of uh, I don't know, webinars. I don't know what to call this. Um, that uh, Anthropen and the WCAA has sort of put together. It's officially unprivileged, but uh, it, it is important that we all actually uh, see this as, I don't know, as an experimental thing in general. Um, people will experiment, um, even though the topic is privilege, and they will experiment with both language and, I don't know, genre or form. Um, and uh, um, voy a decir algunas cosas en español, porque una de las cosas importantes aquí es eh, practicar un poco, hablar o presentar cosas que no sean en francés o aún en inglés. And don't worry if you don't understand any Spanish, don't worry, I won't, I won't say too much in Spanish. Pero eh, de todos modos, esto es una colaboración entre Antropen, que normalmente publica en, en francés, y WCA, el Consejo Mundial de Asociaciones de Antropología, de una manera u otra, Eh, vamos a tener cinco de estas eh, con personas de muchas partes del mundo y a veces en diferentes idiomas o parte va a ser de diferentes idiomas. Eh, Marta o Francine, ¿tú te quieres decir algo en francés o en portugués? Yo voy a comenzar en francés. Je vais commencer en français. Okay. Uh, nous avons convenu avec Martin que je, je, je dirai ce petit mot. Uh, we just uh, talk, uh, Martin and me, that I will uh, start for that part. Uh, I just want to say that I am very happy. Je suis très, très heureuse que nous soyons ensemble pour ce premier uh, webinaire uh, convenu depuis uh, un bon moment et fortement travaillé. Je veux dire quelques mots. I want to say some words about Anthropen. What is Anthropen uh, for the larger audience? Euh, C'est le premier dictionnaire euh, francophone d'anthropologie open access euh, qui est ouvert à une version euh, décolonisée de l'anthropologie, à l'anthropologie publique et maintenant à euh, l'anthropologie multilingue ou à une expérimentation, like uh, say, uh, Virginia, uh, in communication and diffusion of anthropology. Uh, nous pouvons juste, uh, j'aimerais que vous sachiez que l'origine de ce dictionnaire publié en français, une des intentions de celui-là, uh, c'était de nous amener à uh, pouvoir à affirmer la possibilité, le droit hein, de, de, de penser, uh, d'écrire et de diffuser dans la langue finalement ou dans laquelle nous enseignons. The intention of Anthropen was first to uh, take the right to think and write and disseminate in the language of our teaching. Uh, now, maintenant, nous sommes dans un contexte différent uh, puisque ce laboratoire multilingue uh, nous amène à tracer le chemin pour un cadre hein, de l'anthropologie globale qui permettrait de faire se rencontrer, d'articuler l'aspect local et l'aspect multilingue des pratiques 
et de la pensée de l'anthropologie. I will say it in English. Uh, the idea first was to, uh, like I say, to, to have this thing in French, the dictionary, but now we are starting that uh, experiment uh, to try to articulate the local vision of anthropology, both linguistically and both in the tradition of uh, different uh, word anthropologies, to articulate that and to articulate a way of uh, communicating and practicing anthropology in the global context. It's not a question of, ex of the exclusion of the Anglo uh, word, but it's a question of inclusion of the different tradition and the different ways of knowing and practicing and editing and disseminate. That's it. So welcome to everybody. Uh, I just forget to say that I am Francine Sayan <laughs> and uh, founder of uh, the dictionary with Mander Kinani, uh, an anthropologist from Switzerland. That's it. Francine, in Portuguese? In Portuguese. Mm -hmm. uh, queria dizer que agora somos, de, a vou dizer mais. Uh, mais corte, uh, nosso dicionário, nosso dicionário, when I pass from English to Portuguese, it's terrible. <laughs> uh, Anthropen, Anthropen é nosso dicionário uh, que existe agora em, French, em, em, em francês e que queremos uh, começar essa, esse trabalho com vocês. Uh, para fazer uma articulação entre a, a, a vers uma versão uh, local e, e think, um, I, it's terrible I am not prepared for that oh, okay. I'm <laughs> I, sorry. I, won't, I won't say it it will I will mix everybody for that I'm now. sorry now, okay just sorry that's it's not okay. because I'm not able, I'm just <laughs> not Don't there. Worry. I just thought, you know, you could do that. Yeah. Fine. We, 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 you know, we're experimenting, so we're experimenting. That's that's nice. It's okay. <laughs> Since Rose, Rose, you're still here, right? Yes. Um, a I, I wanted to explain to people that um, speakers are very interesting anthropologists. Rose, uh, who is normally in South Africa, but is currently doing field work in Namibia um, and has a first, she's not so sure about her internet. So uh, Jean Suk, who was supposed to go first, will go second, and uh, I think that's fine. And Nandini, who, uh, uh, who was scheduled to go third, will go third. Uh, but I want to do quick introductions um, because one of the things about, about this is that we really are drawing on our connections all over the world. And so people don't necessarily know each other. Uh, I do know Rose though. I met Rose, I don't know, a number of years ago when I was in Africa. And she was, I think then was the official title of vice president of ASNA, the uh, Anthropological Association of Southern Africa. Rose, am I right? You were vice president? Yes, that's correct. Okay. That is correct. You remember that, right? And I remember. I having, do. I remember having a long conversation with you, uh, actually, by going ahead and becoming president. But you know, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's, but that's that's what I remember. Anyway, uh, her official name, as you know, is Rosabelle. I'm still here, the bandwidth is a little bit low. Yeah, it seems that Virginia had trouble with her internet. Hello, Virginia, are you there? No, we lost Virginia. So Francine, can you please 
step up. Oh, there she is, but no sound. Give me a second. No, okay. Virginia, unmic yourself. Turn on your mic. It did. Oh, there he goes. Okay, there, there I am. Okay, anyway, um, so she has published a book uh, with Bergen uh, in Addis Ababa, uh, um, something called Challenges to Identifying and Managing Intangible Cultural Heritage in Mauritius, Zanzibar, and Seychelles, published in Dakar, 2011, and Postcolonial African Anthropologist, which is co edited with Francis, who I also know, in South Africa. Um, things Left Unsaid and uh, Pandemics are two poetry books published uh, in Bamenda and New York. And I don't know, it, the bio she sent me said a forthcoming edited book, but I don't know if it's still forthcoming because it was supposed to come out in 2022 uh, by Palgrave. It was entitled The Palgrave International Handbook on Blue Heritage. So, um, Rose, would you like to lead us off? In, yes, in, thank you. In form you would like, yeah. Thank you so much for that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying something dual here. I don't know if you can see me on the one screen. We can see you. I, <laughs> can, see my... you. I can see oh, you. Oh, great. Can, can everyone see me where I am? No? It's just that on my laptop, I think the camera is not, not alive. So I'm just opening it up on, on my phone. But it, I just wanted to, to kind of show my face and greet everyone um, personally and to say thank you to Anthropen for inviting me to this event. Um, and um, yes, and I'd like to just briefly show you um, quickly where I am and what inspired um, this particular talk. Um, so just give me a second. I can just switch the, see if I can switch my camera around. Ah, I may not, hang on. You may not be able to, it's fine. I may, I may. Oh. I just wanted to show you. We see. <laughs> so I'm in the, I'm yeah. in the desert, really. So yeah. this is what inspired the talk. I just <laughs> wanted to share that part with you before I switch my camera off. Okay. If I, if I may, um, Virginia, so I'm going first, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so let me share my screen. And hopefully the, it will play well. The beginning. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, Give me a second. I'm trying to do this with multiple hands. I'm going to just switch off my camera for a little bit. So I can focus on the talk. Okay. We hear you, Rose. All right. Do you want to comment on this? Because. Rose, there's no sound. Yes. Yes, there's no sound. We know what to do when you're not here, but I don't know. Do you want to comment on this? No? Yes, to... I'm just hoping that I can do it quickly. I'm not too sure. Um... No I don't worries. know it's live, so Don't worry. Yeah. Is it able to? Are you able to play it from your side? I did send the recording. Yes, we can. Perfect. If no, you can play the recording, please. Thanks. Perfect. I'll stop sharing. Okay. You're seeing the, the screen, right? Right. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak um, at this particular event. 
So I hope um, that what I offer today will be something slightly innovative and creative. It is an attempt to use the auditory and the visual to convey some of the creative processes that I've been using in order to rethink um, the ethnographic work that I have been doing in Southern Africa. My name is Rose Boswell. Uh, in my papers, I'm known as uh, Rosabel Boswell. I'm an anthropologist and a poet as well as a writer. And I have been doing field Be careful, we lost the volume. Of Africa, and in that space, I am conducting um, cultural heritage research uh, and anthropological research on coastal communities in five African countries. But this evening or this afternoon or this morning, wherever it is that you are, I'll be talking about um, an aspect of my work which is largely creative. It is in the field or the domain of poetry. So without further ado, um, let me um, proceed. In sharing um, some of these thoughts on the potential um, linkages between dreams, creativity and uh, insomnia, I suppose, it's also possible to comment on the potential link between insomnia and creativity and privilege. Because if we consider um, some of these great uh, authors and writers and artists, who have been able to produce in these times of insomnia, one must also ask what were the particular conditions in which they lived. And it's possible to argue that some lived a rather bohemian existence where they did not have much in the way of material goods or influence. But it's also, I think, important to note that there have not been that many researchers and writers and authors and poets that have been able to share to the same degree their creativity to a global society. And so it's very interesting, I think, to me that even in the context of something as common to all human beings such as sleep, there is an element of privilege and exclusion. In this regard, I felt that I was somewhere in between 
between worlds of dreaming and waking, between thinking and creating. And I felt that in that space, there was no need for discipline, no need for theory, no need for dogma, which in the lucid states, in the wakefulness states of being an anthropologist, one is always occupying the space of thinking, of uh, disciplining the self, disciplining the mind, applying theory, searching for theory, creating theory. In fact, in the strange twilight dream world space, I only experience a strange synchronicity and a compelling to commit what I sensed in this in-between state on paper. You could say that I was actually woken by Maya, woken by Maya Angelou, and I didn't even know that I had been awoken by her. I read somewhere once that poetry was for the poor, their way of sharing powerful words and imagery with the world. And this made me think about or meditate on the topic of, um, of the event today, which is on the subject of privilege. Where is privilege located? And is it only those who have the ability, the dogma, the principles, the disciplines, the theory? Are they the only ones who can convey particular meaning through words? Or can everyone do it? Or is it the case that poetry, that supposedly ill-disciplined, unformed uh, genre of creativity, that this is something which uh, uh, is only for the poor? And so I propose actually something slightly different, which is that in the uh, uh, um, following, that poetry uh, and certainly via ethnography is a, is a great privilege. To compose poetry, even if I am an insomniac, is a privilege. It is a privilege to be in that state, to have that time to think, to string words together, to feel the joy of the words passing through my body, to rise just like Maya, no matter what anyone says about where I should be, to defy, defy and defy endlessly. It is a way then, poetry, to walk proud beyond official analytical frameworks and man-made theories of human existence. My poem is entitled, I Have No Fear. For why should one fear? On 31st October, why should one fear of between and betwixt? I have no fear of ghostly turns or shallow graves, for ideas rise from loosely packed soil where initiates shed their skin like ancestral beings in eastern rivers deep. I have no fear of betwixt-betweens. My mind awakens at twilight and sleeps at dawn. It meets the unwoken and lets words spill like oil on a pristine shore. Of Hallow's Eve and other things, I have no fear. So thank you very much for the opportunity of sharing some of my thoughts and the creative space um, as best rendered as I could offer it um, in the format, the virtual format that we have available to us today. And I really hope that in sharing this presentation, I was able to convey in part um, the phenomenal creative process that I have personally experienced as an anthropologist um, for poetry really has allowed me to play with words um, freely and to understand the power that they have in conveying first of all uh, a sensory ethnography and uh, in allowing uh, to make the messages arising from the ethnography, to make these 
hopefully more accessible to a wider audience. In this, I also realize, of course, that having the time uh, to uh, compose poetry, whether in uh, a moment of wakefulness or a time of uh, sleep or rather insomnia, um, that I do have this, 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 this privilege of being able to use words uh, in the ways that I have. And just to add, um, I suppose, as a concluding statement, that these poems are also uh, composed in different languages, which I speak. And um, in those ways, um, I hope that they are also able to transgress uh, boundaries, uh, to cross boundaries uh, of meaning that perhaps um, are unique to certain languages. So I hope you will have a look at some of my poetry um, and also the ethnography and maybe you will see uh, ethnography in the poetry and you will see poetry in my ethnography. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ricardo. Can you can you get us back? Okay. Um, one thing before before we proceed, I uh, <clears throat> I don't know. You saw the, the 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 view of the desert. I don't know how long uh, Rose will be able to be with us. So I I think what I would like to do, if the other participants will allow me is to take, I don't know, a few minutes, if necessary, four, five, six minutes, uh, to raise questions, ask questions, make comments to Rose and have her, are you there? So, yeah, have yeah, Yes, I am. Uh, great, and have her respond. I, I should say, while you, you think, if, if you need to think, that uh, uh, Rose is really pretty much a polyglot. I don't know if uh, her doctoral dissertation was written in Dutch, but she does have a PhD in anthropology from the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam. And uh, uh, I think, I don't know, how many languages have you published in? Or do you, do you speak? Um, do you do in, things? in Creole, I, well, I think in, in Creole, English, and French. Oh. So it's a three, three. Not, not <laughs> Dutch, right? So you wrote your your dissertation in English? At the and the dissertation was in English with uh, extracts of Creole and French. <laughs> okay, great. Anybody, you would need to uh, unmute yourself. Anybody? Francine, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself, remember, Francine? Can't hear you. Oh, there you go. Oui, merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Je suis absolument touchée. I am highly touched about uh, the kind of presentation you have uh, shared. Je suis moi-même dans une situation d'écriture de la poésie et aussi dans des contextes de situation d'exclusion. I am also uh, writing poetry and interest in the link between ethnography and exclusion. So um, I think you are right. Je pense que c'est très juste to think about poetry as a privilege, pour penser la poésie comme un privilège. But how so? Uh, and it's a question for you, uh, mais aussi c'est une question pour vous to think about the, the way, the way, it's okay, it's okay? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the way, uh, what is, how you think about the link very straight between the South African tradition of anthropology, the link uh, of uh, the question of creating language and the, the, the ethnographic work. Uh, you, you say some words about that. Vous avez dit quelques mots à ce sujet, but I really would like, j'aimerais beaucoup vous entendre 
davantage. I really would like to hear a little more about those three, this, the, that articulation between the tradition of anthropology, la tradition en anthropologie en Afrique du Sud, cette question du langage poétique que vous utilisez, maybe the necessity of this language, the poetic, uh, this poetic language you need to use, and the way you think ethnography, et la façon dont vous pensez l'ethnographie. Merci. Rose, did you catch that? I mean, it's amazing that Francine can yes. do translations uh, on can. the go. <laughs> it's, it's awesome, absolutely awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Francine, uh, and everyone for, um, for the questions or comments. I'm sure some of you are formulating at the moment. Um, so it's, it's quite a complex um, issue. I mean, if you look at um, Southern African anthropology, it has tended to be quite formulaic um, in the understanding that the field exists in this objective space, uh, that it is out there in the sort of two dimensional world. Um, and it is from this, this world and this space that you draw both your inspiration and from which you uh, attend to the larger questions of, of the discipline. I think in, 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 in starting with the issue of um, the strange in-between state of insomnia, it was quite interesting because it's not considered as a legitimate space for any form of creativity. And it was only when I went um, further into it that I discovered that in fact, some of the, 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 the most prolific artists and, and, and writers um, had uh, attempted to recreate uh, the creative conditions uh, produced by insomnia in order to, um, to, to produce new, new uh, uh, data, as it were, new ways of actually framing uh, the social world in which they, were, they are existing. I mean, one person that I think most people are familiar with is Salvador Dali. Uh, in his, 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 he was famously known for trying to keep himself awake in order to produce some of his absolutely timeless, <laughs> excuse the pun, timeless pieces. Um, so in terms of Southern African anthropology, I think we, we and South African anthropology in particular, we, we have been schooled into thinking that the field exists in an, an objective space, that there are researchers and the researched, um, you know, the uh, uh, objects of inquiry <laughs> who, that are necessarily out there. And this has been contested for some time. Uh, in fact, South African anthropology has uh, also been uh, marginalized because of this, the idea that there are those who are the researched and those who are the researchers. Um, and I, in doing the, the, the poetic work, I felt that it was a way to actually break away from this genre and to perceive um, the, the ethnographic process as a largely poetic and a creative one. Uh, that it is not necessarily for conveying uh, information to a very narrow uh, group of people, um, you know, who understand or perceive the world in a particular way. I also felt that it was an important tool um, to bring into the discussion the embodied and sensorial aspects of human existence, um, to use the words uh, of poetry in this kind of emotive and embodied uh, kind of way to use a uh, uh, language that was perhaps a little bit more bold and more expressive of the diversity of, of human experience. Um, and I felt after having done that, after having allowed the insomnia space to produce uh, the kind of poetry um, that would speak to my work in the daytime, that uh, uh, um, I was able to then um, recreate that same level of creativity in the daytime writing. So when I was writing supposedly scholarly pieces for um, journal articles or book chapters, um, that same level of creativity and that same emotive and embodied and dare I say, non-masculine kind of, 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 of writing uh, was able to come through. Uh, and I had no fear of, 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 doing, of doing it that way because it then allowed my own personal voice uh, to, to, to be put into the public space. Whereas before, I, you know, I always wondered about this comment, uh, um, I think it was from Archie Mafeji, a very famous uh, social scientist here in Africa, 
and I suppose he's also globally known for his work against colonialism, who, who asked whether anthropologists, uh, independent African anthropologists are in fact ventriloquists. You know, are we just channeling the words, the theories, the ideas, the frameworks that have come to us from what is ostensibly known as the global north? And in doing this and in giving that space to another world, to a space in between, I was hoping to see whether I could break away from this ostensibly uh, 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 oppressive uh, uh, tradition. The last comment I want to make is around the issue of privilege, because what, what I think was really clear to me is that um, as a, as a, obviously as a, as a woman and as a, as a mother, because of course these realities are also um, to be factored in into the academic and other work that we do, um, that time was, was an enormous and absolutely critical resource that, that um, many, many uh, uh, women and mothers often find that because they live in a highly patriarchal setting, they have very, very little time, little time to themselves for any form of creativity that they are always uh, in the process of producing and keeping others, you know, on an even keel uh, and society almost expects that of them too. So there are these gendered um, stereotypes about how and where women should be. So the point I want to make is that it was a privilege to have that strange, even difficult time of insomnia, to have that space and time for creativity. Uh, almost like, you know, the universe actually opened up the space of insomnia to say, look, you need to be creative and if you can't do it during the day, this is when it's going to happen. And it was in that space um, in 2021 when I was had a, quite a long stretch of insomnia where I was able to write an entire poetry anthology. Um, and it was linked to some of the work that I'm doing for the ocean cultures um, field work that I'm doing now. And so that poetry is now feeding into the daytime research, into some of the questions. In other words, there is a cycle of creativity that is basically taking place as a result of the insomnia, which happened quite serendipitously. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit complicated, but um, there's some really interesting things that have emerged out of it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Rose, before, before uh, your time is up. Um, can I ask you, you know, I noticed several times when you were talking just now that um, you said daytime. Uh, so, you know, like many artists I know, they, they, they do something during the day to earn money and then in the evenings or on the weekends, they, they do their artwork. Uh, do you think of anthropology as, uh, as, as part of your daytime work and poetry as part of your, I don't know, nighttime work? Yes, so obviously, what, one of the things that, that happened um, during the pandemic is that the, the daytime and nighttime became increasingly blurred, uh, even though one's day is actually structured, you know, by, by familial, um, the sort of, you know, familial requirements of, you know, sending children to school and so on, looking after elderly parents. Um, some of these activities and processes take place largely in the, in the daytime, daytime hours. Um, but what I found was that um, in, in doing this work, um, that I was beginning to see the daytime work as the more formulaic work, that I would wake up and I would have a theme or set of research questions in front of me that had been approved by the ethics committee. And these are the questions in the data that I would kind of attend to in the day. And then at night, there would be this complete release from the research formula uh, that uh, would, would come into play. And I soon began to realize that in fact, that these boundaries between daytime and nighttime could, could be blurred if I so cho chose. I mean, I, I didn't have to actually stick with these notions um, of, of, of standard time as it were. But it was also really interesting that it, it was also about uh, the, the notion of working between dusk and dawn was also very interesting because it mirrored the, for the ocean cultures work, it mirrored the particular transitory space that we are in now, the anthropogenic space that we're in now, this, this moment in time where we have the opportunity to make really important choices about climate change. Um, and that we're at this almost tipping point that the dawn is basically coming. Uh, 
you know, and if if those changes, according to the UNFC Triple C, if those changes that are proposed or mooted are not taken into account, then we're surely going to go towards a daybreak that is going to be quite disastrous for everyone. So there were, I, it's very difficult to unravel it all, but to me, it seemed like there was this notion of real time between daytime work and nighttime work. And then there was also this kind of symbolic time between dusk and dawn, where these, these pieces on, on, on climate change, these poems on climate change were being composed. And they talked about the different feelings and experiences that humans have, you know, of, um, of this uh, uh, natural world, uh, the oceanic world uh, that we have. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Let's take advantage of this now. Okay, if, yeah, okay, Magda. Yep, um, just, well, I don't know if it's a quick question, but um, this is a, since the driving topic here is a multilingual anthropology, I was wondering if um, the type of writing that comes out of this insomniac state or like, um, it, it, it can be seen as a, uh, an in-between language also, uh, something that could be more easily translatable or not um, between different experiences, I would say. Thanks, Magna. Rose? Thank you for that, Magna. That's a very, very good question. And I, I remember uh, when I was quite deep into the, the, the experience, I, it, it struck me that obviously I'm one of, I don't know how many billions of people, you know, that have had this experience, whether for a short or an extended period of time. And I wondered about the translatability, you know, of that language, which is emerging from that state, whether it's something that is common to, to all and therefore potentially transferable and translatable, um, or whether it is, um, you know, something that is unique because obviously I'm largely, mostly English speaking because of the context that I'm currently in now. Uh, and if I were to compose some of these pieces in the local language, would, would they, you know, would they be translatable across that world that also speaks that language? You know, would people get it? as it were. Um, but I think for me, what it showed is that there are potentially other common states. We, we, we as human beings, we experience other similar kinds of states, insomnia, sleepiness, excitability. Uh, one could, could think of many different emotional and physical states that we're experiences, uh, you know, dis-ease or, or, or discomfort, different degrees of discomfort. And that these, in a way, these embodied forms of experience and expression could be <laughs> languages in and of themselves. And, and when, when, for example, I'll give you an example. When I was doing work um, in, in uh, Zanzibar and in Mauritius in the early 2000s, it struck me that embodiment was something that was very, very important to people and where there were uh, communities um, for whom such embodied uh, engagements were common, uh, dance, uh, singing, uh, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the, uh, the uh, making of, of, of crafts, various kinds of crafts, there would be a, a kind of recognition, you know, that, that for example, like rhythm, let's just take dance, uh, that, that there would be, you know, recognition and potential synchronicities that would emerge as a result of that particular form of embodied expression. And it made me wonder whether that insomniac state could also produce that, they could, that there could potentially be a language there that could be translatable or uh, understood across different worlds, um, mainly because it is a shared human experience. Thank you, Rose. Um, I, I, I think in terms of time, we could go on, but in terms of time, I would like to switch to Jin, Jin Suk. Right? Um, but let me just say a few things. I mean, first of all, I should apologize every once in a while, my internet seems to go. And if that's the case, I, I'm sure Ricardo can take over sour. Uh, Jin Suk is, uh, is from Korea. Uh, she got her PhD, however, from uh, a university in the U.S., the State University of New York at Albany. She is professor, and from her email, I don't know if, if this is still true, but uh, she is professor and head, right? 
are you head of the School of Liberal Arts? You oh, were. yeah. <laughs> Happened yeah, to forget. Yeah, you forget <laughs> to include that, but it says so at the bottom. Uh, okay. Uh, she's professor and head of the School of Liberal Arts at uh, Ulsan National Institute of Science and Technology in the Republic. Yeah, she is mostly linguistic anthropologist, uh, but in some ways, I think she's also a social cultural anthropologist. But her doctoral research topics included Mayan identity, but some language ideology in Guatemala. Um, she uh, interestingly teaches liberal arts courses at a science and engineering university in South Korea. Um, her work has focused on sociolinguistic research in Korea, including the topics of language ideology, linguistic landscape, and international education. She has recently been engaged in the research on media representations of gender and regional identity in Korea, focusing on joking as a speech trend. And unless she has changed her mind in very recent days, I think she's going to share some of that with us. Um, her English is obviously really good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have encouraged her to not just stick to English, but we'll see. Okay, my she Korean is, is very good too. <laughs> yeah, Korean, I'm fully Korean. Well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway. Thank you. Uh, thank you for introducing me. And I think in order to share my screen, I think probably I have to be a co host. So if. I think you are. If you let me uh, do that, so yeah, thank you for uh, um, you know um, giving me this chance to uh, share in my work. I mean, uh, even though it's kind of like it's gonna be a short presentation, but I was afraid, uh, you know, and I was panicking, and I emailed yeah. Virginia like, "Oh my God, what if I'm not gonna be experimental enough, like Rose, right?" So then uh, Virginia kind of encouraged me, like, "You know, it's okay. You don't have to be that experimental and that creative." So I just decided to be kind of uh, not that creative. And so that can be my experiment, right? So <laughs> kind of uh, doing uh, regular presentations, um, but, you know, just focusing on joking and in relation to privilege, uh, you know, just by talking about the concept of privilege in, in Korea. I mean, and there are lots of definitions, but I thought that I could kind of talk about some uh, of the issues that can be also related to joking. So with that, I'm going to share. Um, you are not co-host, so you can. Yeah, okay, thank you. So yeah, I'm not gonna uh, bore you with a very long presentation, I hope, because I just made only like 20, um, you know, slides anyway. So privilege and joking and why joking? And then let me start with uh, just very traditional uh, concept that everyone is probably familiar with. Um, but I'm going to just, just say like what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus on who can joke. I mean, we, we can all joke, right? But I mean, if you think about like who can joke, who's going to be the joker and who can, who should laugh? at someone's joking and who defines a speech act as a joke. And then this can be all related to, uh, you know, exercising and displaying privilege, right? So with that, I would like to show that privilege is, is you know, can be understood as control, like controlling someone's behavior and privilege as, you know, making a voice. And I think in a way, um, a kind of, you know, implied, you know, when Rose talked about poetry as well, some kind of like a making your voice, right? So I thought that joking can be also a great example to show this. So these are what I'm going to talk about, as I just mentioned. So the traditionally, oh, uh, this is what we know about joking and social relationship, you know, very, very old time anthropologist, um, you know, defined joking as an exchange of insults, right? So you can kind of insult someone. And how could you insult someone? Well, if you are friends, right? So if you have some equal relationship, right? So it can be very dangerous, but then, you know, there's like a very thin line that it can be a joking, it can be an insult, right? So that is what we know. But with that, we, you can also empower the weak because, 
um, it's not so clear if I'm insulting or, or you know, just like making uh, some funny uh, stories, right? So then um, if you, you know, remember Mary Douglas's structuralism and she talked about um, that jokes can be like anti-ritual, something that does not exist to create a predetermined order, but to create a new order. Okay, so then, um, you know, you can see a lot of old um, uh, satires um, that can be, you know, can be joking. So that can be kind of subversive side of joking that can kind of, you know, make current hierarchy upside down, right? So that probably is the power of joking, right? If you actually uh, think of the power. So then, um, you know, if someone is making a joke, then you can laugh, right? So laugh can be understood as like, yeah, okay, I'm with you, you know, I'm gonna just show empathy, right? But then also uh, sometimes it can be understood as subservience, like, you know, when you don't really think it's funny, but you have to laugh. Like, I don't know how many of you have that experience, but can you tell the difference between the real laughter and fake one? If someone's laughing, probably not. But if you, kind of know if someone is faking the laughter and yet you still enjoy it, that means you're privileged, right? <laughs> because you're making a, a joke, but that might not be funny, but then someone has to laugh. So I think that can be a really good indicator, right? So, um, you know, if, and then also you make a joke and then if someone is not uh, laughing, you can also say like, oh, where is your sense of humor? You know, this is supposed to be funny and you're supposed to laugh, right? So when, uh, if you think about it, laughter is, you know, you know, is an unmediated external indicator of internal state because, okay, it's, it's really funny, right? And therefore, it's the only appropriate or successful response to a joke. So if joke is successful, that means you made someone laugh, right? So uh, what I'm going to introduce you uh, with this background, okay, joking is kind of like a funny thing and I'm making people laugh or something. And then here's uh, one um, joke that is recently coming out in media or, you know, people just, when, when they have conversation, they sometimes just throw uh, this kind of joke. And in, in the US, I think they uh, understand this kind of pun, a speech play as dead joke, right? Kind of a little bit corny and not funny joke, but I think a lot of dads or even grandparents make a lot of jokes like that. You know, they're trying to be kind of funny and very friendly with their children, right? So Aje Gegu, Aje means um, just old men, right? But they're not super old, maybe in mid-aged men. So mid-aged men's um, joke is Aje Gegu, right? So one example is, um, I'm gonna just read it in Korean, so see, we are multilingual. <laughs> 세상에서 가장 큰 컵은 World Cup. So I mean, I'm, I put the uh, English translation as, well, what's the biggest cup in the world? The World Cup, right? And 안주는 더 안주나? Anju is a snack when you're drinking, and then the Anjuna is actually kind of homonym, um, I mean, I'm sorry, homophone for snacks, right? So, you know, especially when you are analyzing joke, it makes it even unfunnier, of course, but, you know, this is a joke. So, um, you know, I thought that in order to understand better, I thought I could put one dad's joke that I can find. I only know 25 letters of the alphabet. I don't know why. So that kind of thing is that joke or ajegegu, right? So I was gonna I'll show you then, you know, then what, what is it related to privilege anyway, right? Here is a comedy program of show that is called Bujang Ajegegu. Bujang means a manager, right? So a lot of managers, bosses, you know, they, they make jokes, right? Then you can see that the person in the middle is lower status, like he's an intern, right? And then he's like, 
is being tortured, right? Because of the Ajay, Pujang Ajay Gegu, right? So this is, an, uh, is often said to make the listeners groan in annoyance, right? They're like, oh, I have to listen to this. I cannot believe this, right? So this is um, daddy joke, dad joke in the US. And then in Japan also, they have similar speech genre called Oyaji Gaku. So basically it's almost the same as Ajay Gegu, right? Oyaji is uh, middle-aged men, right? So here I put one example on uh, the one hand English and then on the other side in Korean, right? Should I read it in Korean? Since, you know, the, I'm not going to show the comedic programs, I'm going to have to perform in Korean. Go ahead, so, read in yeah. Korean. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to even have to kind of uh, make a different voice then. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll try, okay. <laughs> Okay, so the manager is like, 어제 해오라는 소리는 다 했나? 인턴, 예, 오늘 오후까지 다 해놓겠습니다. 내가 인턴 때는 그러지 않았어요. 나는 말이야, 얼룩 말이야. And you're supposed to laugh, but the intern said, 네? What? 그래서, 하하하하, 깜짝 놀랐지? 아, 네, 정말 깜짝 놀랐습니다. Ah, 그럴 때는 그냥 웃으면 돼. You can just laugh. Like, ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> 그렇지, 그렇지. And then at the end, he's just so sad. And then he's just looking uh, somewhere and then talking to his mom somewhere like, mom, probably I have to tolerate this, right? Because I have to get a real job. I have to get a regular uh, contract, right? Because right now I'm just intern, right? So what it what this shows is that, okay, let me just go back to this, uh, you know, real Ajegeko part. Nanu Maria, Maria means I'm, as for me, but then Maria also means I'm a horse, right? Because Mal is a horse. So it is kind of sounds the same as Nanu Maria uh, is for me, and um, I am a horse, right? And Olung Maria, Olung Mar is a zebra. So it just doesn't make any sense, right? But then it's supposed to be funny. So intern is supposed to laugh, right? So this is only one of the episodes, and I probably you see in, in many, many, uh, you know, other like sitcoms or some dramas where managers make really corny jokes and people are supposed to say like, oh my god you're un unbelievable you're so amazing how did you come up with that is what you're supposed to do right so I'm gonna also you know tell you them some of the terms that actually uh Koreans um use but then that are also in Oxford um dictionary these days because it became just so uh, popular. And then those who watch a K drama or something, they're supposed to know <clears throat> this term in order to understand what is going on. So one term is konde. Uh, konde means just some older person uh, who believes they are always right, right? They're like, they could be in their 40s, 50s, or 60s, and they can be kind of higher position in a company, or it can be a professor, or it can be just some, you know, old man on the street. They think they're always right. And so they can even give you advice, right? So probably you can, you might even think like, oh, you mean like a mansplainer? Yes, mansplainer can be also understood as gunde, right? So here's one example. Is I'm giving you advice because you're like my daughter. Well, how would you say that someone is like your daughter, but then like, is, okay, I'm giving you advice. Okay, listen to me, right? Because I'm always right. So that is gunde. And then this is also like some bujang manager's kapju. It's a one-sided relationship in which one party is inclined to overuse his her power, but then usually his because the managers are usually men, uh, based on the privileged position of a country or customs, right? So this konde and kapju are really, uh, you know, kind of essence of these uh, old. Um, mid-aged men, especially in higher position, is privilege, right? And then they they might even bluntly say, like, oh, well, do you want to get promoted or not? What are you going to do, right? So they can actually just abuse uh, their power, right? So then going back to Ajay Gegu, Ajay's privilege through Ajay Gegu is that the 
Bujang, the manager can just, you know, joke about it, you know, make some jokes. And then you think, well, okay, I don't have to laugh if it's not funny. But no, in that particular relationship, you have to laugh, right? So he might seem like making a friendly jokes, but the listener on the lower side of an unequal relationship is forced to laugh. So this is going to be the last part that, you know, I'm going to relate privilege with a joke. And then uh, like this Bujang, I just said like, oh, okay, in this case, you're su just supposed to laugh. That means it's a joke, right? So you laugh, right? So who can joke and who can define it as a joke, right? Um, joke can, can disempower and insult the weak. And I think it used to happen um, some time ago, but I think it's still happening, such as, you know, they can ridicule certain race, um, gender, sexuality, and the disabled. And I think a lot of uh, stand-up com comedy still has some parts of that because they think, oh, it's supposed to be funny, right? But now uh, those who are disempowered can make their voice, right? They can just say, it's not funny, right? It was even hard to say it's not funny, long time ago, but then now you, you know, they can say, well, it's not funny, sorry. No, it's not funny, right? So then what is funny or unfunny? Who decides it's what we can think about? And then I know that uh, some comedians these days complain, that, oh my God, cancel culture makes comedy really unfunny. I have to be very careful, right? Because of this, right? So they wanna decide what's funny, right? So I'm going to just pass because um, it's kind of related, but, you know, I can talk about it later when there's a time. So then when someone says like, I'm just joking, okay, you know, don't be so serious. I'm just joking. Does it mean it, the meaning is empty, right? Joke does not pursue any meanings from the speaker's perspective and only listeners find the meaning. So they're often pressured into denying or downplaying those forms of verbal discrimination, dismissing incidents as merely banter or jokes, right? So that's also kind of a privilege, like, well, I can define what is joking, what is not, right? So um, this is the conclusion. One can exercise his or her privilege for, uh, through joking, but then privilege can be invisible because it is just a joke. Right. And then I just put this cartoon off from somewhere. If she's abused, why didn't you report it? And then I think that is a kind of the privilege that people don't really see. OK, thank you. And actually, I put the photo here because one time I gave a talk about joking and then I was I had to kind of perform almost like a stand up comedian, although I was not a comedian, but then I had to wear this kind of clothes. So I thought that it can be uh, nice to put it here. So thank you and contact me if you have further questions. Thank you, Eugene. So uh, Nandini, did, are you in a position now to speak or should I take should I let uh, some people ask Jinsu questions? Nandini? Okay, uh, well, maybe, can you, can you, oh, I, I, I love seeing you as a Indian Jinsu, but can you uh, un, I don't know, turn off the, uh, the share screen? Nandini, are you there? Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what's happening with Nandini, but uh, uh, maybe we can take a few minutes now to make comments or ask questions. Anybody? Oh, Carmen is here. Well, that's good. Celebrating. I know you are, yes. <laughs> We this are also, <laughs> yeah. Okay, anybody have any thoughts for Jin Suk? I mean, I could start. You want me to start so you can think? Okay, Jin Suk, you, you will need to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, who else in, uh, in the world, including maybe in, in Korea, actually talks about joking or privilege? Anybody? 
anthropologists in particular? Um, I guess they don't necessarily do use the word privilege. Maybe maybe joking and power or you know something like that. Um, Thank you, Gordon. <laughs> uh, by the way, actually, Gordon uh, is the one who, uh, you know, asked me to do this. So, you know, I'm so honored to be part of this. And I hope I didn't disappoint him. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so actually, you know, since uh, this, the, you know, the theme is privilege, I thought that I could kind of connect with what I'm already interested in. And I think, uh, you know, uh, so far, I mean, to my knowledge, I don't see anyone who is kind of trying to relate privilege and joking, and especially with mid-aged men's joking. But you do, right? I mean, you Yeah, are. I mean, yeah, now I'm trying to. Anybody, any thoughts or comments? Anybody? Go ahead, Gordon, but you have to admit yourself. Yeah, yeah um, Jin, so you, you talk about humor and privilege, and that was very, very revealing. And as an older white man, I unfortunately <laughs> see myself in a couple of your, your, your slides. But um, there's also humor as weapons of the weak. I mean, I, mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, it's interesting that in Tagalog, mgoy, which means thank you in Cantonese, also means you monkey. And so, you know, domestic helpers love saying mgoi to people saying you monkey without them knowing what's being said. So can oh. you talk a little bit about humor as also a way in which privilege is contested? Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, so actually, I didn't, you know, I wanted to focus on kind of privileged, privileged men's um, joking and, you know, their kind of metapragmatics of joking. But I think, yeah, you're right. Of course. Um, those who don't have power, um, they can use joking. And I think that happened a lot. You don't have to find only this kind of like conversational joking or something, but even some, you know, parodies, for example, you know, usually uh, kind of lower status people uh, parodied their boss or, you know, long time ago, even some uh, higher high class people, Yangban or, or even the king, right? So that happened a lot. So, you know, it's not it's not something like a new, right? So yes, of course, the, you know, joking can be uh, weapons of the weak as well. So, I mean, that is how they can also have a voice, right? So, you know, they, it's not that they're trying to uh, be privileged, but, uh, you know, they think joking can be also a weapon uh, to challenge the privileged. Yeah, and I guess I'd want to go a little bit further here because it's also true in Japan that from all I've seen that um, some of the Oyaji you're talking about, young corporate workers love to harass the Oyaji because they don't know how to use their computers. And so yeah. you know, they'll say, wow, old man, you don't know how to use your computer. So the same hierarchy that's been built into the language in Korea too, I'm sure, can yeah. easily be subverted. That must go on in Korea as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you're yeah, right. I mean, it does happen. But, you know, if you think about it, who really has power to review that? That is what you should think about. You know, someone in the higher position is going to review you. So to decide whether you're going to be promoted or not. Right. So I guess, you know, that's in that sense. I guess it, it can be kind of sort of like, you know, in a structuralist term, there could be some liminal or communitas, right? Like, oh yeah, I'm going to just say some non-honorifics and I'm going to joke around, you know, with my uh, boss or something, but that can be a very short time and probably they cannot really go on and on. But actually hearing you sit, talking about Japan, I'm quite surprised because I thought Japanese might be, you know, more reserved than uh, than Koreans in the sense of, uh, about challenging the privileged. Okay. I think Monica has, uh, hand. Monica has, a, has a comment or a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, it's just um, um, uh, off of uh, Gordon's comment, it was just to point out that I think there's just an interesting intersection here between the multilingualism bit of what we're trying to do here and the joking and the privilege insofar as it's precisely in these situations where you're called to interact in some way and you can use the multilingualism that is the mark of the marginalized, but to get back at the powerful. So I think Gordon's 
example shows that. Uh, my father used to tell a story about his um, high school in Montreal, and I guess it would have been the 30s, when all of the students were Jewish and, and Yiddish speakers, and the teachers were all uh, Anglo uh, monolinguals, and their teacher would sneeze, at, which is a kind of a turn relevant point. You're supposed to say something mm -hmm. conversationally, interactionally. Uh -huh. and so what the kids would say was uh, the Yiddish for you should burst, but it sounded like the thing you're supposed to say to somebody when they sneeze. Uh, this is directly funny, obviously, for the kids, right. and the teacher doesn't doesn't see it. Um, I've also been in witnessed lots of situations in among bilingual kids, French French English bilingual kids, um, kindergarten kids, for example, who are making bilingual puns, mm -hmm. which their monolingual teachers didn't understand. Right. And so, you know, there, there's a way of using that unequal distribution of an unequal valuing of multilingualism mm -hmm. to do things that are funny precisely because they're out of place. They're not supposed yeah. to be done and they can't be seen. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think there's, I mean, so that is why, you know, you're right, that the pun can be uh, almost like some secret code that only they can understand. But then in the case of this Ajegegu, uh, it's not quite that high level <laughs> uh, secret code, you would think, you know, that that's why they said like, uh, I don't know if it's funny or not, is what people, people are saying, like, oh, I know 25 alphabets, I don't know why, like, uh-huh, okay, <laughs> so it doesn't seem like that much, you know, high level. But, but is it possible that it's precisely because of the position in the relations of power. So yeah. it's, it's funny when it comes from lower down. Exactly. Right? It's not yeah. funny when it's somebody in the powerful or the privileged position ah. trying to use it uh -huh. to somehow or other, you know, deny or level the unequal relations of power. It's like, oh, come on, mm -hmm. you know, we know who has the power. Uh -huh. uh -huh. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Because in fact, I mean, it's, it's, it's a short presentation, I didn't mention it, but that kind of pun can was very uh, widely used among like teenagers, right? So they were doing that among peers and they thought, wow, this is so funny joke. Oh my God. So actually that can be also kind of winning, you know, friendship. Uh, so that kind of power, but maybe, you know, probably Monica is right that like when your boss is saying that like, oh, okay, you know, am I supposed to laugh now? So probably, so it's not the, the nature of joking itself, but then the relationship is what really matters. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you for pointing that out. That's great. Nandini is back. So I would like to turn to her. I don't know, if, Nandini, if you want to explain what's going on, but uh, should I just introduce? Yeah, I mean, whichever way. Uh... Let, let, let me introduce you and then you can explain. Uh, Nandini Sundar is officially professor of sociology, but she is an anthropologist. Uh, I know <laughs> she, has a, she has a PhD in anthropology from Columbia, I think, right? Yeah. Um, um, obviously, as most of you know, it, it, India was a British colony for a long time, uh, but most people in India don't really speak English. She does. And uh, I think a lot of university folks do, but uh, um, nonetheless, um, so her official title is Professor of Sociology at the Delhi School of at Delhi University. Um, she is on multiple advisory boards, uh, current anthropology, sociology, contributions to Indian sociology, how, Cambridge Journal of Anthropology, Anthropological Theory, INSEE, et cetera. But, you know, I don't know how relevant that is, but it may be relevant. I, I actually also know that some years ago, she was co-editor, co-editor-in-chief of Contributions to Indian Sociology, which is called that, but has always also always been an important anthropological thing in India. Her recent publications include The Burning Forest, India's War Against Maoists, which is published by Verso in 2019, um, so just before the pandemic. It has been translated into several Indian languages that might be relevant for, for this. 
uh, two edited volumes, uh, something called The Functioning Anarchy, co-edited, and it came out in 2021, and Reading India, Selections from Economic and Political Weekly, 1981 to 2017, co-edited and published by Orient Black Swan, Black Swan in 2019. She has also published journal articles. Um, she's widely known for her, uh, her interventions in uh, democracy, authoritarianism, and American, uh, academic freedom. Uh, she's been awarded a number of prizes, including Sarigas Memorial Prize in 2003, Infosys Prize for Social Sciences, specifically for social anthropology in 2010, the Esther Bosser Prize for Development Research in 2016, and the Malcolm Adisishia Prize for Distinguished Contributions to Development uh, Studies in 2017. I have known Nandini for some years, but uh, um, not not well enough. And uh, anyway, it's all yours. Thank you, Virginia. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for inviting me to do this and for having faith in me always. Um, always. And I mean, you're really one of the best mentors that um, I've had. It's really uh, great to be part of anything that you're part of. Um, so, uh, just been having a little bit of um, excitement around my house because uh, with our current Hindu, Hindi supremacist government, um, there've been a number of attacks on media freedom and on academic freedom. And uh, we are going through one of those crises with the media, my partners with the media. So we have press and police in and out of our house right now. Uh, but having said that, I have the privilege of being able to uh, do this conversation despite everything. And I want to start with, I want to kind of focus on two or three different issues to do with privilege. The first, of course, being language. Um, currently, um, I'm perhaps not the best person to talk about uh, linguistic diversity in the university. I myself um, do not read and write academically in um, any language other than English. I'm a fourth generation um, English speaker um, and um, English is my first language. That's what I grew up with, uh, even though my parents don't speak it. Uh, I, mean, I come from different parts of India. They spoke English to each other always. Uh, so perhaps the, my comments on um, the dangers of phasing out English within the university are colored by my own privilege. At the same time, I do want to um, note how in a multilingual uh, country like India, uh, English is both um, a language of privilege for a minority, about 10% of um, the Indian population speaks English enough to read and write and know English, but only 0.2% uh, speak English as their first language. So there is a big, uh, given our current government, which is um, a Hindu supremacist government, um, along with the idea of Hindu uh, Hindus being dominant, uh, they also want the homogenization of um, many aspects of the country and particularly the imposition of Hindi um, in all central universities, including medical colleges, engineering colleges. Now, historically language has been a big issue in India right from 19, um, the 1950s when um, there was a sort of raging debate uh, during the making of the constitution as to whether Hindi should be the official language. And the Southern states which um, speak Dravidian languages um, argued against that and several people argued against that. And uh, the idea was that English and Hindi would both be official languages uh, for the country, but uh, there are there is no national language. There are 22 official languages, and these are the two link languages. So each state has its own language, and um, 
although Hindi is spoken by the majority, I mean, the largest number of people who speak any one language speak Hindi, uh, it's still not you know, spoken by the majority of Indians. And any attempt to have only Hindi in central universities, which are attended by people from all over the country, would actually disprivilege um, you know, large numbers of people. Now, even within Hindi, there is a range of different sub languages, dialects, which have been grouped um, under the rubric of Hindi. So as with all standardized languages, um, Hindi itself is a sort of hegemonic language. Now with respect to English, it's English is the language of privilege. But with respect to other languages within the country, uh, imposing Hindi would be giving privileges to the Hindi speakers, uh, which would disadvantage students and people from other parts of the country. So the first thing I want to sort of talk about is how this debate about having anthropology um, in different languages um, is something that is welcome um, in a global sense. It's, I really appreciate um, the kind of idea behind Anthropen, um, but I'm also worried about the translation of that attention to diversity and how it might be carried out in a multilingual context like India, given that any attempt to actually speak across languages involves, you know, translation of context, translation also, because English is such a language of privilege, it's important for people to know it and have access to that global world of scholarship and engagement. Uh, so for instance, we find um, that a lot of uh, subaltern groups, people, former untouchables, scheduled castes, uh, indigenous people want education in English rather than in their state mother tongues because uh, English is, you know, the idea is that the elites have had access to English and by denying it to uh, subalterns, denying it to them in schools, they're actually perpetuating a class system. So privilege in this multilingual context um, can mean a lot of different things. Um, the second um, thing that I want to, uh, how much long, how, how much time do I have, Virginia? I'm sorry, I lost count of um sorry it's okay i will another... stop you in i don't know five seven ten minutes okay right thanks um the other uh issue that i want to talk about is um a particular um moment as in um now when um privilege breaks down so uh in our current under our current government, which is similar to right-wing authoritarian governments the world over. Um, the major fault line right now is religion and Muslim in, and Islamophobia in particular, um, anti-Muslim um, uh, hate speech, genocidal hate speech. Um, and there've been a number of cases of Muslims being lynched, um, individual Muslims being lynched, Muslims being collectively punished for uh, participating in protests, widespread arrests of uh, Muslims for all sorts of things, as well as you know, students, uh, journalists, and others. Now, what does one do when the normal markers of privilege break down under such authoritarian regimes? Um, uh, and what comes to mind most immediately is, um, for instance, uh, the attacks on Muslim film stars who are, um, you know, they are the most kind of um, privileged Muslims that you can get there. They have, these are um, film stars who are top of, you know, they're like the biggest stars in um, Bollywood and yet they're constantly being attacked. Their loyalty to the country is being doubted because they're Muslim. We had a Muslim vice president who was 
again, um, attacked, um, sort of derogatory language being used, cases being filed against film stars simply because um, they are Muslim. So to show the sort of wider audience of ordinary Muslims that, you know, if we can attack somebody who's that rich and famous, then everybody is vulnerable. So what I also want to sort of remind ourselves is that there is normal privilege and there is privilege in times of crisis and the two kinds of privilege may not always work uh, seamlessly. I mean, the same kind of privilege may not last seamlessly into uh, times of crisis uh, when, uh, when there is a kind of genocidal uh, atmosphere being created. The third case that I want to uh, bring up is something that was actually um, uh, part of a whole discussion about anthropological ethics. Uh, this is regarding a young anthropologist who has been working in Kashmir. Um, she's a US-based anthropologist uh, who has been working on mental health and, uh, you know, victims of torture um, and Kashmir has always been um, uh, a site of major human rights violations but in 2019 um, the government effectively turned Kashmir into an occupied territory by taking away uh, its political rights uh, the instrument of accession which bound Kashmir to India um, at the time of the constitution was read down and uh, internet was taken away, year long, um, you know, curfew was, uh, curfew was imposed. There was a kind of shutdown for almost a year of Kashmir. And it continues to be a space where voices are silent, academics are, uh, you know, kept under surveillance um, and journalists are not, there was a Pulitzer, a prize winning photojournalist who was not allowed to attend the Pulitzer ceremony. Um, uh, she was, you know, stopped at the airport. So this particular book about um, torture in Kashmir is something that really uh, challenges the Indian state. However, there was an anonymous email about how her father had been in the intelligence service uh, and had worked in Kashmir um, when she was 10 years old, several decades ago. And um, she was accused of being dishonest to her informants because she did not reveal this to them um, and give them the choice of uh, whether they wanted to speak to her or not. And also not uh, reveal this to, she did not reveal this to her uh, fellow uh, anthropologists. Now, I think that so she was accused of having dominant upper caste um, mainstream India privileges with respect to her informants uh, and with uh, you know therefore not really um, ensuring consent. Now there was a number of anthropologists signed letters condemning her. She's been kind of virtually boycotted uh, by the by her local anthropological community. Um, I think there are several questions that this particular case raises. One is about uh, the relevance of parentage uh, when one is doing fieldwork and has not relied upon one's parent for access to the field. Um, I can also think of cases where uh, people could be doing field work as a way of atonement, or for instance, if you've had a father or mother in prison and you're working with um, prison inmates, you may not want to, you, you're working on you know, crime, you may not want to tell your entire anthropological community uh, that your parents have been in prison. Uh, there are a number of ways in which parentage may not um, and should not matter. And in fact, I don't know what the parents of my close colleagues do. I've never asked them and they've never asked me. It may come up in conversation, uh, but to ask is itself a way of establishing privilege if, for instance, you come from a well-off background and you're you know, asking somebody where they come from. Um, there's also concerns about conflict situations and whether 
Um, revealing parentage at that time would have shut down all kinds of access, would have actually not made possible this book, which I think is very important anthropologically in challenging the narrative of the Indian state. Um, and I think um, it's also questions of patriarchy, how much young women in particular should be identified with their father's um, activities. So there are ways in which privilege um, cannot be assumed, uh, even within the anthropological context of informant and um, anthropologist. And I think there has to be a more nuanced understanding of how privilege works and when and where it actually works. So in all of these three contexts, I just want to raise the question of how Privilege seems obvious when um, we examine it, and it is very obvious, it works in all sorts of ways. But there are also times when privilege um, breaks down, can be used against somebody, uh, and it's actually uh, used, um, and I don't mean just, I don't mean in a sense of um, backlash, but it's actually used to further create new kinds of oppression the backlash against so-called privilege. So I'll stop at that. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Nandini. Um, I know it's now 9.30, but 9.30 here. It's, uh, it's I don't know, uh, whatever. It's, it's other times for most of you. Um, any thoughts, comments, questions? I, I, I do have some, but I don't necessarily want to privilege myself. Let, let me start, maybe that will give people uh, some time. Uh, Nandini, um, okay. You know, I really, I, I, I respect you a lot, but uh, you know, I, I think this was very provocative for, for us, but can we talk about the anthropological community in India for a minute? Um, do they have privileges? is because my understanding is there aren't all that many anthropologists in India. Am I wrong? Well, there are um, a lot. I mean, there is an Indian Anthropological Association. There are several departments of anthropology um, and some mixed departments of sociology and anthropology. Now, um, you had written to me about this one case where um, the uh, Anthropological Association. So uh, there was an IUCN meeting uh, with, um, sorry, not IUCN. Um, IUAS, yeah. IUAS, right. Meeting with a particular school which um, has been involved. It's a kind of mass factory for indigenous children. And the people who founded the school are quite close to the ruling regime and a number of anthropologists, um, so anthropologists in India have historically worked on indigenous people. That's been one of their main um, areas of research. Uh, whereas sociologists have worked on other aspects. Urban, so it's sort of seen as more modern than anthropology, which has been kind of confined to um, physical anthropology and a lot of it uh, with indigenous people. So the anthropological community kind of defended um, this, uh, there was supposed to be a annual Congress held or three early Congress held at uh, this school for indigenous people calling KISS and uh, various other people protested about legitimizing KISS and uh, the anthropological community then claimed that they were, uh, it was imperialist of the world anthropology uh, association to withdraw from um, hosting the conference and um, that in fact this case was legitimate and so there are clearly differences within the anthropological community within India and how they see their own privilege vis-a-vis -vis indigenous people. I know that but uh, Gordon I, I think you know that too. Uh, following you, Gordon. 
Gordon, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You know yeah. a bit about uh, about this. I know you know. I don't know very much. I don't probably don't know enough to say. I don't think here. Yeah. But you do know enough to know that the anthropological community in India is split. Right? Yes, I, I know that very well. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to venture any further into this. We know the split all too well. It's very real. But man, these are areas that I'm afraid to say anything about because it's just too. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but but could I be provocative and then do you correct me? So you uh, your second. Uh, the second thing you talked about was Islamophobia, right? Um, is that shared by by anthropologists in India? I know there's a lot of Islamophobia here. So, you know, there's a larger problem of academic freedom, um, and the uh, you know the ways in which the universities are being affected by. Islamophobia more broadly. Um, one um, problem has been that the university is, um, I mean, that the government is packing universities with faculty who are sympathetic to their Hindu supremacist worldview. This is especially public universities. So even if right now we don't have a lot of anthropologists who are sympathetic to the Hindu. Uh, supremacist right it's entirely possible that in the future they could be uh, quite a dominant stream within anthropology uh, in history and political science you already have you know um, fairly strong left right divisions uh, in the history congress for instance uh, and now we see even say within delhi university there's a large contingent of um, you know right wing history teachers being hired or uh, so uh, Islamophobia is something that has not been there within the university community, but the university community is not immune from the wider pressures that are happening in the country. Carmen? Yes. So one second, Nandina, that's fascinating because in other places, for example, in the United States, it would be unthinkable that anthropologists would support Donald Trump. Um, Carmen, in 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 Brazil, would it be possible that anthropologists would support Bolsonaro? I doubt it. So it's that might, interesting that, that in India you could have a division. So, yeah. but India is different. Uh, yes, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah, Carmen, your hand is up. Yes. Yes. Uh, Yes, Gordon, it's possible that an anthropologist support Bolsonaro. We had a couple of anthropologists working for the agrobusiness and doing laudus uh, that favored the invasion of quilombolas, etc. But let's go back to India <laughs> uh, and privilege. And thank you for your talk. And I was thinking with my uh, ignorance about the India reality that uh, when we thought about India and privilege, we thought about a caste, a caste system. Uh, we, you talk about religion, we talk, you talk about uh, the split of, in the Anthropology Academy, uh, the language, but you didn't talk about caste. I know there is a lot of criticism uh, around uh, the work, about the work of uh, Louis Dumont, for instance. Uh, I, I'd like to hear us talk up something about that. Okay. No, thank you so much. I was going to talk about uh, caste because it is perhaps the most enduring um, form of privilege in India and has been written about as such um, within the anthropological literature on India. It's been a major part of that literature. Um, I didn't talk about caste because um, in a way it's it's so clearly and unproblematically a form of uh, privilege that uh, it's, I mean, there are of course ways in which caste is being transformed um, that for instance, uh, there is an attempt by the 
government, the, the RSS, which is the mother organization of the government, which is a fascist Hindu supremacist organization, which has been working for the last hundred years to establish a Hindu nation, to mobilize um, what are seen as lower castes in order to use them as part of a united front against Muslims and Christians and um, others. So um, in a sense, caste privilege is being overturned in order to strengthen a religious boundary. But there are other ways in which caste is being maintained. And um, so I think Caste also applies across religions in India. So it's not as if it's only, um, it's, it affects language, it affects um, class. Uh, you know, there's a clear overlap between um, Hindu upper caste and well-paying jobs in the organized sector. So it is, I guess, the most enduring fault line of privilege, but overlaid with a lot of other stuff. Um, now, so. But Nandini, can I follow Carmen's question? Um, <clears throat> I, I know that things are in some ways changing in India in terms of caste. And some people, some anthropologists and sociologists talk about class being more important. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but uh, is it mostly the anthropologists around the world who don't really know India who keep Focusing on caste as, as an enduring form of privilege? No, it's in, I mean, caste has been um, within India, within Indian anthropology, within international um, anthropology on India, uh, a major field of discussion. So, um, I mean, it's impossible to actually study India without studying caste at some level. Uh, but how it operates and uh, you know, the ways in which people study it may vary. Carmen, is that is that uh, an okay response for you? Carmen? Yeah, yes, yes. Well, I, I also like a, a little comment about uh, the work of Louis Dumont because I, I love uh, <laughs> Carol. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, in a way, it's interesting, the work of Louis Dumont, I mean, the one argument um, about the way that privileged thinking about caste has been encoded into divisions in the anthropological literature. So, um, Dumont and other people writing about it from a more symbolic um uh, angle have uh, are seen by many people as not uh, focusing on the discrimination that caste embodies. So seeing it purely as a principle of purity and pollution uh, does not adequately address the ways in which caste is similar to race. And so a lot of recent work has sort of um, talked about how it's not so much a specific cultural principle, uh, but it's a form of stratification which is similar to other forms of discrimination. And that itself is trying to challenge the way in which privileged anthropologists have written about caste historically. Thank Francine. you very much. Okay, thank you. Francine, did, I don't know, you're making and a couple of times. I wasn't sure whether you were asking to speak. Francine? No? Okay. No? Francine? No? Did you want to say anything? Go ahead. But you have to unmute yourself, remember? Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, you presented some uh, very important numbers at the beginning of your talk, and uh, I understood that uh, Hindi language is not an academic language. And uh, would you say, in the context of our webinar, that the issue, I will 
it's a provocative uh, affirmation that the issue of uh, the language of communication in the global uh, context of anthropology for you would not be an issue in the context of the discussion you uh, present for us today. Um, I think Maybe so. I, think... Well, I don't know. I'm just asking to you. Right. I think um, personally, I think English has to be um, the major language of research um, that links not just India to other um, forms of, I mean, other sites of anthropology, but within India, um, there has to be bilingualism in English and in the different state languages. So uh, for, re for the sake of research. Um, also within India, there's an imbalance between um, some of the languages like Tamil and Bengali, which have quite st strong academic um, literature in those languages and Hindi, which is also, um, although it's, it's perhaps sort of officially dominant, culturally and academically has not had the same strength as some of these other languages. Uh, so, I mean, just to give an example, my uh, book uh, was has been translated into now four languages of which I'm still waiting for the Hindi translation, you know, five years later. So, whereas it came out within a year in Tamil, in Telugu, which are Southern languages. So they just have much stronger academic publishing industries compared to uh, Hindi. Um, so given this kind of imbalance between languages, which also reflects a certain political economy of, um, of these different states. And it's also, I mean, you know, India's, um, it's like we are, it's like the European Union, right? In terms of languages, it's, these are fully different languages just as in Europe. And so we're talking about uh, one country which has got all the problems of having to manage um, the linguistic diversity that you have in Europe. Monica? I don't know whether your your question is connected, but you're next. It's actually connect, connected to Carmen's question. Okay. Um, so, um, and, and, well, to Nandini's response, if I'm understanding you correctly, one of the things that seems to me, Nandini, that you're um, pointing to is uh, the ways in which nationalism can be used to at least um, discursively, performatively um, erase other forms of inequality. So you were saying that one of the things that, that Hindu nationalism does is to say, we're not gonna talk about caste as though sort of caste wasn't there as a structuring principle of, of inequality. And I can certainly think of lots of you know cases where nationalism does that for class. And so you have a nationalist movement which pretends to erase these things and mobilizes a population on the basis of nationalism and the promise that, you know, if, you know, those of you who are low, lower down on the class or caste hierarchy uh, join us in this movement, then things will be better for you. But certainly in, in my own uh, research, it's, you know, that doesn't, it may be the case for some small segment of the population, but it doesn't actually change the principles of um, a structural inequality that it kind of hides under the table. So I was just wondering whether you could say, you know, something about the role of nationalism in approaching a, a critique or um, obfuscating the possibility of a critique of such principles of social inequality, of privilege to use the language of today's webinar. Yeah, you're absolutely right that nationalism is used to paper over all the cracks, um, both um, class and caste. Uh, but at the same time, given the form of nationalism that we have, uh, so uh, if you look at sort of the form of nationalism that we had with um, 
just after independence with the making of the constitution, it was a kind of secular nationalism where uh, unity and diversity was the kind of overarching theme. So it was okay to have uh, different languages, religions, and caste was something to be overcome. Um, whereas under our current form of nationalism, caste is something that um, is to be overcome only to the extent that it can be used to create a Hindu bloc as against a Muslim bloc. But at the same time, the government is, this ideology is inextricably upper caste. Uh, so it's become okay in the public sphere to say things like, um, for instance, there's, you know, I mean, if you can imagine a situation where um, there was a gang rape by white Ku Klux Klan people and uh, they were then released and the logic given was that because they're white and they're supremacist, they have good morals and therefore should be released, which is the kind of logic that is being used for upper caste to release them from the most heinous kinds of crimes or it's being used as a justification for all sorts of things. So there is on the one hand, a nationalist papering over, on the other hand, a nationalism which is being framed to project the traditional order as good and something that the country should go back to. So, so how does that position a lower caste Hindu? So it positions them in a, uh, again, there are divisions within the lower caste political organization. So there are some who are strongly against the government, but a lot of the smaller lower caste, because caste is such a fragmented uh, phenomena that even among the lower caste, there are, there's a whole range of castes which are in some sort of hierarchy and numerically and in terms of um, status as well. So the ones which are really at the bottom may then go with the BJP to get some purchase uh, and recognition. So mm -hmm. it's um, because it's so fragmented, there are attempts at creating all kinds of blocks and hegemony within those blocks. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. not very clear in terms of uh, just one nationalist ideology. Right, which is Jinsuk, interesting. Before, before you go, Jinsuk, are you still there? Yeah. Yes. Do you want to say anything? I know. I know. Uh, it's very late. Okay. Can you go to sleep? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just I just sent a DM to Virginia, and I was gonna just sneak out, <laughs> but then she just yeah, <laughs> didn't yeah. let me go. Okay, because okay. I, I didn't really wanna like interrupt or like what was going on, so I was I gonna just go. But... Um, it's been a, like a pleasure. It was a delight to participate in here, but actually, it's getting really late, and I have to get up early tomorrow morning. So I'm afraid I have to go. I'm so sad to leave now. And then, you know, I will uh, definitely participate, you know, again in um, this Anthropen uh, events next time. Thank you so much for your well, listening. All right. it, it's almost two hours since we started. Yeah, so, yeah I know. And it's I could go on and on. But... Just three, we could go on and on. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, did uh, you no, there? I was just uh, thanking Jinsuk for. Oh, for thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So uh, before we all go, um, look, does anybody want to think aloud or say something about I don't know about privilege? We have we have had participants from the southern part of Africa, from Korea, from India. Um, we were also supposed to have this this fellow from Kenya, but didn't show up, so I don't know. But uh, did we talk enough about privilege? Uh, okay, Francine. You, 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 you maybe know. just a comment. Uh, it's very general, but uh, I am thinking of the objective of the of the seminar and the way we wanted to link the local tradition of anthropology, the linguistic tradition also, and a notion here, privilege. And uh, I am. We will have matter to think about how to manage our future uh, webinar. 
And uh, we, I understand that uh, letting go is the way uh, we are doing. And it's very interesting to have this freedom now to exchange and try and experiment. It's important to do that outside of the normal frame of communication. We are subnormal. <laughs> but I, I, I am not sure now uh, how much the linguistic question was crushed, crushed our discussion. Uh, it was very variable from one participant to another. And also to address the question of the anthropological tradition. So the variation uh, between the participants is quite important. And maybe it's a question of the mode. Uh, each one choose to communicate. Maybe it's something else we have to have a reflection. But any kind of uh, comments uh, participants would like to share after reflection about that first experiment with us, it's very important to receive your comments and to receive your the way you experiment the thing and the way also uh, for you that kind of experiment uh, raise some new questions in, I would say, the global anthropological task. Good point. I could say some things, but it needs to go to sleep. So. Wait, wait, do you want to say anything about that? You, me? Yeah. You um, okay. You first. Well, okay, you... okay, I'll just say, and, and well, um, in Ahura, I mean, I was experimenting the experiment, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't quite sure exactly, but I think, you know, it's kind of uh, different ways of presenting and then kind of bringing different, um, kind of examples to talk about kind of, you know, the range of uh, definition of privilege was, I thought, uh, interesting, right? Because like each one had kind of like a different aspect of privilege, because sometimes it can overlap with just simply, you know, unbalanced power relationship, sometimes like inequality or you know, like there are a lot of things or some even might say like, oh, well, isn't it about elite? thing you know that sort of so it can um, have diversity but I thought you know every participant uh, kind of dealt with some uh, important part aspects of privilege and with the different examples but I think what it just came to uh, my mind is that probably uh, you know next time if we have uh, this this kind of thing even though diversity is good, maybe there could be uh, a little bit of standardized uh, thing as well. I'm not, I'm not saying we all have to do, print, you know, PowerPoint presentation, but, you know, maybe like you you should bring uh, something from uh, India or bring, some, you know, something from Korea so that we can have some, uh, dis, you know, some comparative discussions as well. So, I mean, that can be just one idea, but I thought what we did today was also you know, very interesting because I've never participated in this kind of webinar. So I thought it was pretty good. Okay. Uh, Nandini? Uh, no, I enjoyed uh, listening to the others despite the kind of confusion uh, at home. And um, I'll have to think about it a bit more before I could, you know, think of a larger comment. Um, but I think the topics that you've chosen, privilege, minorityism, um, uh, for the series um, are interesting. And the idea of having this kind of multilingual dictionary is, um, I mean, I think very challenging. So I hope it goes well. One last thing. Um, I, I think one of the hardest things actually, Francine in particular, was uh, getting out of our training. I think we're all trained to do academic work in a certain way. And uh, Rose might have had an advantage there because she is also a poet. And uh, uh, I, I remember hearing from both Nandini and Jean Sook in semi-panic, when am I going to do that experiment? <laughs> uh, because, you know, we're trained. 
we're trained to do certain things. So that might be harder than, than, than other things. Um, I don't know that we will always have English as the common language. Um, I don't know. I, I, hope, I hope this is not the way all of these things will be, but uh, I don't know. In my parents' generation, it would have been French. Um, but you know, nowadays it's probably English as a lingua franca. But I, I, I think the main issue actually is the academic paper format presentation and how difficult it actually is to experiment with that and still feel one is of value. That's my thought. Right, Jinsu? Yeah, feel free. Okay. Well, so I mean. I, I would say it does have value. I wasn't I wasn't saying the experiment does not have value, but um, I think there could be uh, some confusion like, am I doing right? <laughs> like kind of, and as you mentioned, like well, because of my training. So yeah, it was really hard to get out of that training. And also uh, speaking of multilingual uh, format, and I think, I think we can try in different languages. I think probably uh, most of you uh, know either French or Spanish. So, you know, I think next time can be mixture of Spanish and French or English or something that might be also um, really fun, I think. <laughs> yes, but the great problem is the, the, the problem Anthropen faces is it's too Eurocentric. That yeah, fact, Chinese yeah. is the dominant language. In, in, right. It's more spoken by more people as a native language than any other uh, people on earth. So, yeah. but if we did this in Chinese, nobody would listen. So this is an ongoing issue that Anthropen's going to face. Mm. Nandini, I know you. Um, no. I know you need to go. Yeah, I mean, I need to end it anyway. But. Fancy. So thank you again, Virginia. It's yeah, really it's an experiment. Maybe we didn't experiment enough. I don't know. We can try, but I think Gordon's point is correct, right? I mean, we could have this in a variety of other languages, but I don't know how many people would understand. Francina Marta. Podemos hablar en español? Maybe j just to come up, oh, Martin? Well, I, I was just going to say, of course, the issue of a common language will always be present. And I think just the way we use English right now illustrates that. But also, uh, I think the presentations today pointed out that um, there, there might be other ways than just language to language translation. Um, very normative language in anthropology can be translated into a certain way in other languages. But here we've explored other forms of expression um, th that do have very close ties to ethnography and I think um, would translate in a very different way uh, to uh, other contexts of expression, let's say. Uh, so, so for me, this is uh, really something that I take away from this uh, webinar, uh, this idea that uh, there might be so, other roads to explore than just thinking of translating a normative language into another normative language framed in the context of a, the anthropological paper. <laughs> Francine, did you still want to say something? Yes, just uh, uh, another comment. Um, Gordon say, uh, talked about Anthropen as Eurocentric. Uh, in the in the participation uh, up to now of the persons who wrote within the dictionary, yes, they come from mainly from uh, North America and Europe. But uh, I would ask, what is to be Eurocentric, Francocentric, or Anglocentric? Each kind of center of production of knowledge and experience of anthropology have its own bias. So we just try uh, consciously uh, and assuming the limits of our enterprise to uh, share that problematic 
of being the center and the periphery of something. So in that, I think uh, it's very interesting to have uh, our conversation uh, internationally and to uh, accept any kind of uh, critics we can receive and to en enlarge our audience. So I, I'm just, I, it's just a comment. Okay, merci. Some people have to go to sleep. I, <laughs> I have to move on to work, but uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Merci. Gracias. We say thank merci. you. Just merci. Obrigada. No. Oh, obrigada. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. 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 Shukriya, Dhaniyawad, Johar. Bye. Bye. Merci. Thank you. Thank you.